let's just dive right into this afternoon. We have everybody back from the breakout group room, breakout groups. Um, hopefully you enjoyed those. Those that you that came in and joined an optional breakout group, hopefully you had a great discussion. Um, and welcome to this afternoon's session. I think most folks that are with us were with us this morning, but we might have some new faces. So um, this is Dean Smith. I'm, I'll be hosting the session this afternoon. And just to give you a little bit of orientation, we'll, we'll spend um, about 45 minutes in presentation, and then we'll do some Q&A so we can really focus on what you want to take away and apply to, um, to your organizations and the work that you do. We'll take a refreshing half hour break, and then we'll come back and we'll do breakout groups. And the breakout groups then will be very focused on your insights and your takeaways, um, and we'll do some discussion on those. And then we'll talk a bit more about the very specific actions that you can take to put the learnings and insights that you have um, from Sharon's discussion into practice at your organization. So that's how the flow of this afternoon will go. Um, and I am thrilled to introduce Sharon Small. So Sharon, Sharon is a, she's an independent researcher and a leading authority and trainer on clean language methodologies and how we apply them and how we use them in our workplace. Um, Sharon has more than 13 years of experience in the nuclear industry, and she's the author of The End of Therapy, which Sharon, I was unfamiliar with, so now I'm very intrigued. I'm even more intrigued with your work and your writing. Um, so Sharon, Sharon's going to share emergent thoughts on clean language principles and how they can help us um, in, in the work that we do. And I think it's going to be a very interactive dis uh, session. So please be ready to write down your ideas, your concepts as we go through, and be ready to share questions and insights in the chat box as we go through this afternoon. Um, and with that, Sharon, take it away. Feels like Calgon, right? Calgon, <laughs> take it away. Yeah. Um, that, that may be an age appropriate uh, metaphor. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, what, what I'd like you to do for those of you on the computer, um, you can go up into the right hand corner and you can choose um, side by side speaker view. And, um, and, I, and you may or may not have to do that, but next to my picture, there should be two little lines. And when you hover over that, you'll see a line and you can make my picture bigger or smaller. So you can choose if you're visual to have a big slide and a little tiny Sharon or if you're more auditory and um, conversational, you can choose to have a larger Sharon and then a little supportive slide. So um, you guys go ahead and, and decide what you would like to do with that. Um, so I, I have to say this is really interesting because like um, doing something on anti-fragility in the middle of an interstate move and, um, and the time of COVID, and moving to a house that wasn't prepared to be moved into, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, the fires in Oregon, uh, and maybe having to evacuate with everything out on the back porch, um, was all uh, making me feel quite fragile as, um, as I set up this, um, this presentation and really dug into the work. So um, I'm just going to, I just need to get my little chat menu up so I can see it. And uh, I'm not sure how to do the speakers. There we go. Great. Um, so yeah, so today we're going to talk about um, the opposite of fragile. And um, we're going to lean heavily on Nassim Taleb's work about black swan logic, befriending uncertainty and working with emergence. And um, my mentor, David Grove, was a master of turning a moment into an opportunity. Um, he could take something very bizarre and make it extraordinary, the idiosyncratic into the optimal. And he did that by being anti-fragile. And it didn't seem to matter what the client said or did. David made use of it in their best interest. And he loved ambiguity, mishearings, puns, non sequiturs, and synchronicity. And he facilitated, most importantly, he facilitated from the edge of chaos, that, that thin strip that exists between um, order and randomness where life and creativity thrive. So um, much of this presentation that I'm going to be giving was originally given in 2013 by James Lawley, um, one of the 
former um, developers of clean language interviewing. And, and although it was given to an audience that was familiar with clean language, um, I, I trust your experience and your intelligence um, in taking in this information and seeing um, how we might be able to put this information into play now because 2020 has been a really interesting year, right? Um, so how can we befriend uncertainty, work with the emergent circumstances and situations that are happening around us? Um, and that's a very much um, don't just do something, stand there, you know, thanks to Bob, Snell, Bob Nelms. You know, it's that kind of thinking. And uh, so, uh, hang on here. So uh, the idea is to take what we're learning and do different moves than we've been doing, because what we've been doing hasn't been working that well. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about the same thing over and over. Now, is, is anybody familiar with Nassim Taleb's work? And just go ahead and put in the chat menu. You can just put a Y for yes. It can be really quick. And um, if you've actually read one of his books all the way through, um, that'd be great too, because it is quite dense. Um, great. Okay. So, Michelle, um, so we've got some yeses and some nos. Super. And read some, a number of books. Great. So, um, for those of you that know Nassim Taleb's work, um, you'll notice that this is really a nutshell. And for those of you that aren't familiar with his work, this is really going to be in a nutshell. Um, I do have some, um, some reading that uh, I can send on, a link where you can read much of uh, where I've got. It's a free prologue for his work, Antifragility, and I can provide that for you. So, um, yeah. So, we've got wind extinguishes candles, right? A candle and energizes fire. Likewise, with randomness, uncertainty, chaos, you want to use them and not hide from them. You want to be the fire and wish for the wind. So this is an image of California. Um, <laughs> and you can see the sign um, is quite funny. Wear a mask, wash your hands, social distance, and stay safe, right? Um, so I don't know how many of you have been affected by um, many of the natural events that have been happening in around the nation. Um, but Ovid said difficulty is what makes up the genius. It's like, so in times of difficulty, we begin to find out more about who and what we are, right? So what I've got is I've got some slides of 2020. So let's go ahead and look at 2020 and um, just take a moment and think about uh, how you've been affected, your lifestyle, your work, um, whether you have intimate other, you know, others, uh, families, friends that have been affected by some of these events. Um, you know, we've got COVID, we've got uh, hurricanes, uh, we've got tornadoes, we've got floods, we've got entire villages being um, swallowed in India. Um, the earlier fires in Australia during January, their summer or winter. We've got Beirut, you know, a great example of an avoidable issue. California. So that first picture, um, that first slide, the introductory slide, was um, actual dry lightning strikes um, off the coast of California by Santa Monica. And these are pictures um, of some of the fires. So here we had over 12,000 lightning strikes in a week. That is nearly 11% of the lightning strikes experienced across the nation between 2008 and 2014. That's a lot of strikes. So the fact that a lightning strike causes a fire isn't a black swan, but 12,000 lightning strikes in a state that usually doesn't have dry lightning is very unusual. We've got civil unrest, COVID wars, election issues. It's a hell of a year, right? So oh, that's not the Golden Gate. Thanks, <laughs> Bay Bridge. But anyway, um, so uh, yeah, so how have you been affected this year by some of the things that have been happening around the, the globe or the nation? 
Um, do you have anybody personally affected by any of these? Um, yeah, the murder hornets, that's another one. Yeah. So um, part of the idea is um, as, a, yeah, particularly employees, yeah, affected. Um, COVID, yeah, nothing like the locusts in North Africa. I know there's so much more. I mean, we could have just done a whole, like, picture thing of, of uh, you know, tremendous happenings. Um, so what I... What I'd like is to kind of bring your attention to leadership as leadership and management um, and, you know, to the frontline workers and, and the incredible ability they have to actually make um, quality decisions in very extreme circumstances, right? And making decisions is a bit like black swans in that in retrospect, they seem very explainable. Um, and that's where we get the good and bad happening of a decision. And just because a decision turns out the way we want it, it doesn't mean it was the good decision or the best decision. It just happens to be a decision that worked out. So um, that's another topic we can go into later. So this is Nassim Taleb. And um, he began with a book, uh, Fooled by Randomness. And this talked about the challenge we have understanding the effects of chance. And he followed it with the black swan. And this shows how large scale but rare unpredictable events have um, had a great effect on how we do our everyday world at this point. Um, oops, hang on here. And his... Uh, his book that we're going to look at today is Anti-Fragile, and this goes further, and it explains how it's possible to be more than resilient and to make non-predictive decisions under uncertainty and to relate to the unknown without attempting to understand and control it. And I think that's a really important aspect of this is um, there are many things that we have to make decisions about now, and we don't have a complete understanding, and we don't have the Ability to control much of this. So Nassim likes to say that learning by avoiding mistakes is fragile, learning by trial and error is robust, and learning by trial and feedback is anti-fragile. Um, but what does this have to do with clean language, who many of you have seen me talk about clean and clean language approaches? And, and strangely, just about everything, as, as clean language is designed to help us work with emergent and unusual events and to understand them or to help the people who are involved in them understand them differently. And we'll talk about that a little bit later um, in, the, in the slides. Um, but many of us have to make quick decisions and we have to make decisions um, on the fly, just like those firefighters, um, just like those workers who were in the mud. And, uh, and if I have a misspelling, don't worry, I'm not lazy, crazy, or stupid, but uh, I don't always catch my own spelling checks. Thanks, David. Um, trial, trial and error, not trail and error. Um, so decisions based on top-down theoretical methodologies are fragile. Uh, decisions that use experience based on heuristics are robust. And decisions, um, there's an anti-fragile class of bottom-up decisions um, these are decisions that rely on serendipity, mistakes, the unexpected, and stochastic tinkering. And, and I think that um, these are a lot of what we're working with. A, a lot of what I've heard just in the past three sessions is about how to do that. How do we use our trial and error? Um, so we're already attempting to, to use some bottom-up modeling, but it may not be a skill that we've been taught. Um, so one metaphor for doing bottom-up uh, decision-making is, is like surfing blind, right? And I think that Taleb's ideas are not just useful um, to people like myself who are facilitators or trainers, but, but I think um, you'll see that they have much to say about everyday life as well. So um, as a manager, as a parent, um, as leadership, as a frontline worker, um, these have a lot to do with many areas of life and, um, and how we make decisions. So um, there's no exact word for the opposite of fragile. I know that often um, we use robust or um, resilient as an opposite of fragile, but that's not actually um, 
accurate. So Nassim has made up a word, anti-fragile, right? And um, anti-fragility and fragility are on a spectrum. So you have something that's fragile, like this champagne glass is fragile. I, I know it is because it's the only one I have left, right? And then you have something like this that's robust. It's mechanical and um, it has been through moves. It's been uh, thrown in, it's been dropped. It's, you know, it's robust. And then um, mostly, I mean, I like the Incredible Hulk. Now, um, the thing about anti-fragility is, is uh, disorder really helps the Hulk, but it, it doesn't help David so much, does it, right? So, um, so it is a spectrum, and we'll find out whether I'm fragile, robust, or anti-fragile at the end of this session. <laughs> we, all, we all have a spectrum. Is there, anything, um, is there anything that you feel particularly fragile about now, or robust, or anti-fragile, like what area of your work or life may have one of those qualities on this spectrum? Because um, I think a, a misunderstanding is that this expectation that we're to become anti-fragile at all times, and that's just not the way it is. So um, anti-fragility is beyond robustness. Um, the, the resilient resists shocks and stays the same, and the anti-fragile gets better, right? Um, so there's also here you can see changes in value. This is a fragile system and something happens that's really disruptive and it drops. Think banks, you know, during or housing prices during the 2008 crash. Um, and then you have something that's more robust. It can go up and down, but it'll pretty much keep going on for a long time. I mean, um, a lot of our machinery, a lot of our mechanical equipment is like this. At some point it may have a decline, um, but, uh, Occasionally, it has a fragile nature, but most often it just keeps on trucking. And then you've got the changes in value of something that's anti-fragile, and you have a disruption, and something happens, and it gets better, right? So um, an example of that would be um, the World Wide Web. Uh, this is something that has proven itself to be incredibly anti-fragile and has, um, uh, you know, uh, just kept going and growing um, regardless of the challenges that have been um, and actually sometimes the challenges have, have created um, an even stronger internet. So um, we often talk about PTSD but what we don't mention or talk about much is um, post-traumatic growth, right? So Nassim Taleb likes to say that that those people um, who have benefited us the, the most aren't the ones who try to help us with advice, but rather those who have actively tried to, um, and eventually failed, hopefully, tried to harm us, right? And so this is an anti-fragile headline from a Malaysian newspaper, uh, you do your worst, we'll do our best. Um, so that's an example, um, you know, in anti-fragile thinking and preparedness. And Uncertain doesn't equal unstable. Um, the anti-fragile uh, loves a certain class of errors, and those are small um, and iterative. So it's better to, you know, the whole like fail, fail small, fail fast, well, fail fast, but the best is to fail small. So, um, so if you think about like an area that you've become quite anti-fragile or robust in, I think if you look back, you might notice that, um, that you were able to um, continue through uh, trial and error um, and trial and, well, you know what I mean, <laughs> not trial and error, but by uh, small errors and then correcting. Anybody who plays a musical instrument will be familiar with this. So um, the thing about fragility and anti-fragility is they're part of a current property of an object or a system, right? And, um, and this is just, this is the property that gives you the ability to respond to unspecified future events. Um, anti-fragility has a singular property of allowing us to deal with the unknown and to do things without understanding them and to do them well, right? So, um, is there anything that you do really well? Um, is there anything that you've been able to do well, like on the fly? Maybe something was happening and you weren't exactly sure what, but you were able to manage it. Um, 
and, and come through, you know, feeling better for it, stronger for it, more capable. And it's far easier um, to figure out if something is fragile than to predict the occurrence of an event that may harm it. So by looking at our systems and processes, um, how we um, are managing our people, um, how we are going about our work, uh, how we basically are structuring um, what we do, it's easier to notice if it's fragile than to know um, or somehow predict what may be happening that could disrupt it. And the anti-fragile um, is needed anywhere the unknown predominant, uh, preponderates, you know, any situation in which there's randomness, um, you know, unpredictability, uh, opacity, or incomplete understanding of things. And I'd say right now, uh, there's a huge amount of that, you know, just uh, COVID alone is is something that um, science is continuing to iterate and to find out more about. And by grasping the mechanisms of antifragility, we can build a systemic and broad guide to non-predictive decision making um, and be able to do this under uncertainty, right? And fragility can be measured. Um, risk is not measurable. Now, we can do our best to predict it's like science is, um, is not about forecasting. Um, it's about understanding the properties of things. But when we understand the property of something, that gives us the capability to do some prediction or forecasting. Um, so this is part of uh, looking for, um, you know, looking at the properties of a group, for example, um, looking at our processes and procedures. Like when we understand the properties that we're working with, that's when we begin to um, so uh, fragility can lead to, thanks Bob, fragility can lead to um, anti-fragility. And, um, and, and it can, it may be required. Um, I mean, if you think about all of us, most you know, biological systems are quite anti-fragile. Um, maybe not uh, as an individual, but as a species. Um, you know, uh, amoebas, viruses are very anti-fragile. I mean, so... <laughs> So it, it does depend, but that's, that's, a really good, that's a really good point. Um, so when it comes to random events, robust uh, just is not good enough. What we need is we need to develop um, a mechanism by which a system can regenerate itself continuously by using rather than suffering from random events, right? Um, unpredictable shocks, stressors, uh, volatility. And, and I, I also think that this is what is, is being attempted when we're looking at a root causes, when we're um, looking at how are we working with our people, um, when we're looking at a high reliability organization. Um, so, so a lot of the thinking is, is already happening. And for those of you that aren't familiar with, um, with what a black swan is, a black swan is not necessarily a negative event. Um, it's just an unpredictable and irregular event of massive consequence. So again, we can look at the World Wide Web as a black swan that has had uh, both good and bad consequences for us. Um, it's, you know, Facebook is, has come out of, out of uh, the World Wide Web and there's no way that we could have predicted that a, a small program that let us stay in touch with our friends and family um, across the world would um, turn into uh, what it has, which uh, is not all bad and is not all good, right? So, but most of history comes from black swan events. So I will say that those pictures that I showed you at the beginning, the only one that may be a black swan event is the fact that we had 12,000 dry lightning strikes in California. Um, that was pretty unpredictable, not what happened next. Um, the floods, the, a lot of the um, increase in hurricanes and tornado, um, this is uh, related to environmental issues. And um, although they're not desirable, um, they're not necessarily something that we didn't ex expect. Yeah. So the thing about black swans 
um, a bit like decision making, is that they um, they hijack our brains. Because in retrospect, we can explain anything. I mean, we are an explanation species. We're so good at making things up. Um, there's there's even science now saying that our emotions are um, predictive. So we have this predictive quality um, as human beings to uh, kind of pre-think how things are. But this also gives us the ability to like post things, why things happened. Um, so we don't often realize the role that swans have played because of this illusion of predictability, right? And Antifragility is the property of all those natural and complex systems that have survived. So again, back to the biology. Now, the thing about a complex system is that if you deprive it of volatility, um, you will harm it, right? They will weaken, die, or blow up. Think couch potato. As a human being, we need a certain amount of volatility to be healthy. We need uh, to jump and to run and to to. I mean, essentially be kind of shaken up. Um, if we don't do that, uh, we have all sorts of things that happen. Um, uh, weight gain, heart disease, diabetes, all sorts of physical ailments um, can happen from, as a human being, simply being not shaken up enough. Or think of a fruit tree, right? Fruit trees are very anti-fragile. The more fruit you pick, the better the tree uh, produces the next year. Um, so we can be, we can be harming our businesses, we can be harming our families, and we can be harming ourselves um, by, by, by attending to too many top-down policies um, that insult the anti-fragility of systems. So even today, um, during the time of COVID, there are things that are getting stronger and better from being shaken up. I mean, Zoom is a really good example. Uh, they had a hell of a time in the early COVID days with, um, they used to call it Zoom bombing, with people coming into meetings, and they have created an incredibly robust system now. Um, I wouldn't say it's anti-fragile because it does rely on the internet and all sorts of things, batteries and electricity. Um, but basically everything top down uh, fragilizes and blocks anti-fragility and growth. And everything bottom up thrives under the right amount of stress and disorder. Um, yeah, so the, the story of the black swan, Stephen uh, Previtt was saying that it might be worth telling the story where the black swan comes from. And, and it, it basically comes from the idea that, that people had never seen a black swan. They thought that a black swan was, um, just didn't exist. And, um, and they're very rare, and, and it was when a black swan was found uh, that it, it being such a rare and unpredictable event, um, this is just a, a little, and, and Stephen, if you have a different story or something more accurate, you're welcome to type it in. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's where black swan comes from. <laughs> oh, except in Australia. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, Super. So everything bottom up thrives from uh, the right amount. So that's part of it, the right amount of stress and disorder. Now, you don't want to like go throw yourself in front of a car to get more anti-fragile. Um, but uh, walking, running, you know, doing other activities might help, like as a human body, for example. So um, here are some uh, just examples of, um, of fragile, robust, and anti-fragile. Um, you can see, like, you might consider this business, right, which businesses are um, fragile, robust, anti-fragile, science. So you can pick, pick your column from the left. Um, and what column, if you were to choose a column that most related to what you do and what you don't do, which column would you choose? So, okay, great. So we'll keep going. So, um, yeah, so in the chat, stochastic is a $100 word for probabilistic. So, yes. Um, and stochastic processes can be very predictable. You're right. If you're, if you're looking at the right properties, if you're looking at measuring, I think it was um, – uh, Stephen was talking about uh, things being measurable. If you're looking at the right properties to measure, then yes, everything can be measurable in some way. 
um, whether it's subjective or whether it's um, what you would call objective thinking. So, um, so hang on. So, um, question for Sharon from Jake. Um, I respect and like many of the core ideas that you and Taleb discussed, but I've never gotten a satisfying answer to the questions like, what practical non-obvious actions should we take? Um, so basically, Jake, you're looking for a top-down model to tell you what to do, and um, and part of uh, part of this is that I, I'm I I can't tell you what to do, and I can't tell you which model to pick. Um, what I can do is hopefully get your thinking going so that you can begin to determine and develop those. Um, I mean, if you want top-down models, uh, it's it depends. So much is context driven. I think Stephen even talked about that. You know, it's like you have to look at things in context. And, and each context is different and each context deserves its own thinking. And that's not that rules and regulations don't come in and aren't helpful in our day to day lives. I'm just saying that under circumstances that are, you know, when you have a wildfire and you have some predictability of what might happen, but you can't control the weather. Um, your decision making is going to be very different. Um, yeah. So, so we're looking at the process of discovery, right? And um, and it does depend on anti-fragile tinkering rather than formal education. Formal education can um, advise you in some ways, um, but just because you're educated doesn't mean that you're more capable of working in circumstances that are unusual or um, hard to understand. And complex systems are full of hard to detect interdependencies and nonlinear responses. Basically, that means that we have simple causal associations that are misplaced, right? It's very easy to say this causes that. And I, I think that this has also been mentioned in an earlier talk uh, was about um, uh, uh, looking at correlation as causation. That's not necessarily um, the way it happens. It's very easy to take that as the way it happens. Um, and sometimes it's helpful, but sometimes it's not very helpful. And, and there aren't really, um, there aren't many effective methods for solving general nonlinear problems, right? Um, even with a few variables, this can be extremely challenging. And, and an example of that is um, if you come to one of the webinars or if you've taken clean language before, um, you know that once uh, when we're asking questions and we're helping model somebody else's um, experience, what happened to them, their perception, um, or even for a cause evaluation, you know, the, the physical uh, environment, having them talk about that, once you get past about four sentences, it becomes harder and harder to track. And, um, and there are are some uh, simple heuristics based on convex optimization, and that is a big word, and you guys can look that up. But um, basically, uh, they usually um, find sparse solutions, and uh, one solution is basically to get in the ballpark first, right? And that means just find a global solution, something that um, fits it the best, right, with the conditions and the context. And, and then it may be non-optimal, but it may be the best thing at the time, and then uh, try to optimize it locally. And, and that means this is what management is doing. Management is trying to get in the ballpark and then work how to, out, how to find their seat. And, and they're doing that in a way that they really are attempting to help the, the frontline workers. Um, it's the local optimization that needs the bottom up yeah, basically curiosity. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> so it's it's the, the local optimization. It's the bottom up modeling of the frontline workers that that needs to be done uh, more efficiently to to maximize you know effectiveness, right? So just hold back from fully solving a problem um, and wait and wait. And if you think you know, wait a little more and see what else there is to find out. Um, most importantly, complex doesn't equal chaotic. It may feel chaotic, but that doesn't mean it is chaotic. Um, it doesn't require complicated systems and regulations and intricate policies. This can actually complicate the complex even more. The, the simpler, the better. Um, and if, uh, 
intervention uh, is 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 needed, um, you know, just try to make sure that it's the simplest intervention that you can that you can make. Um, the simpler, the better, right? Um, if you don't understand it, basically, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you don't understand it, find somebody who either does or wait and see what happens, right? Um, and avoid theories about uh, uh, about what's happening. Um, whoops, hang on here. Um, in the absence of local evidence, uh, just use tried and true heuristics. Just just stay simple, stay simple, right? Um, here, uh, you don't need to add anything. Most often, most of the time, everything you need is already available to you. Um, adding things just complicates it. Think about our legal system. Um, this is, you know, additive. It's, it's constant rules and regulations continue to be added on top of other rules and regulations. Um, wait, just wait. And, um, you know, this is another thing that I know you guys are already doing, and that is um, paying attention to the pattern and the signs, right? Uh, so in complex systems, causes are, are really hard to isolate. And, and I'm a fan of root cause analysis, and, and I think trying to isolate the one, two, or three primary causes of something um, is very valuable. Um, but what's even more valuable is when you begin to pay attention to the patterns, right? And um, so <laughs> David Grove used to say, people are complex enough, and that's why he made clean language so simple. Um, and, and clean language is basically a, a set of, of questions that help you model from the bottom up. And, and so... Taleb is saying the same thing. People and systems are complex enough. We do not need to complexify. It's making minimal interventions. And if you do make an intervention, keep it simple. What was it? I think um, Einstein said something about, you know, make it simple, but not too simple. So the question is, what is the smallest difference that will make a difference, right? What's the smallest difference that will make a difference? And use bottom-up approaches. And if you haven't been trained on how to do bottom-up modeling or what a bottom-up approach is or how to do a bottom-up approach, seek people and processes that can teach you how to do that. And what you'll find is um, that you become better at non-predictive decision-making. And you also uh, become more curious, right, which makes you a good tinkerer. Um, tinkering is good, um, and it also uh, helps you utilize the opportunities resulting from errors and mistakes, and it also helps you create and cultivate the conditions responding to what is happening, right? And in order to respond to what's happening, you, be able, you have to be able to see what's happening. You have to be able to attend to it, not how you want it to be, not how you want it to be in the future, not how you imagine it to be, but you need to be able to see what's happening now. What's happening now? And working with dynamic reference points, goals are great, but sometimes goals get so concretized, so rigid, so specific, that it, it doesn't lend itself to variability, and you lose the capacity to move and shift as, is, you know, as you need to, to get the best from your work, from the work of others, and um, from uh, the systems and processes that you're already immersed in. And utilize, utilize, utilize variation and surprise. So um, simplicity is not so simple to obtain. Um, Steve Jobs said, you have to work hard to get your thinking clean and to make it simple, right? You really have to work hard to make things simple. Um, it is not easy to do. We are natural complexifiers. We love to concentrate on problems. We love to repair and fix things. Um, so what I teach, symbolic modeling or clean language, um, involves working with emergent properties. 
fuzzy care uh, categories, apparently illogical causal relationships and multiple levels of simultaneous and systemic processes, iterative cycles and unexpected twists and turns. So whether you learn clean language or you learn clean language interviewing, and there are some people um, on, this, uh, on this webinar that have taken uh, some of my trainings and have actually put it into action. Um, Bill, you're on here, right? Um, maybe you could, uh, if anybody's taken the trainings or used the clean questions, um, you're welcome to just pop into the chat and uh, say a little bit about what difference um, that's made. But in short, like in clean interviewing, often any interviewing, right, um, often during the early stages of an interview or a conversation or a decision, the information is um, kind of can be a little messy, right? Um, so the ability to wait um, also gives you the opportunity to help the information um, become more solid, more coherent, more clear. And uh, this is important and it helps reduce the judgment of false statements, avoidance of lies and other negative spins. We often put on information that comes out messy or is slow or um, not forthcoming. Um, and that will change over time. And, and I say facilitators, right? And I mean all of us. And, and that, that's a capital U-S, right? Not U-S, just America, but I mean us as a species, right? All of us need to be able to operate from a state of not knowing. Um, and this is, uh, this is challenging. But like I said, we are little meaning-making machines. We are predictors. And um, we... We love to believe what our mind tells us is happening um, in and around us, right? So um, you can also think of a facilitator as anyone seeking to elicit quality information from another. Um, so use good science. I like to say guess and test, right? Science is developed through theories. Guess and then test. Ask questions like these to gain the information you need. Uh, what kind of X is that X? Is there anything else about that? Where is? What happened just before? Then what happened? What happened next? And when it is the way it is, and it doesn't matter what context you're talking about, when it is the way it is, what would you like to have happen? Right? And um, the Dreyfus and Dreyfus Dolphins to expert model is a really um, nice example of um, how bottom-up modeling happens and when and where. Um, as a beginner, um, we want rule-based techniques. Um, as we become competent and proficient, top-down modeling works for us. Most often, most of the time, we're right. Most often, most of the time, we create top-down models that actually work pretty good. What happens is when they don't work, we're often looking in the wrong areas to figure out uh, what's actually happening. Or we just push harder, right? We just create another model. We just want to like, like push it. But an expert, a real expert, uh, begins to model. They 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 bottom up model. They they do this from the ground up. They have the ability to see what's happening in real time, and to respond to it. Now, I, I know all of you have an area in your life where you are an expert, where you are excellent. And what happens when somebody who's proficient and competent or even doesn't, has never done your job, comes and tells you that the work you've done isn't working? Firefighter, nurse, right? Um, so, so it's not bad. Any of, none of these are bad. It's not bad to have a top-down model. It's not bad to, to use rule-based techniques. I mean, if I'm in the training room, I'll be telling you what to do, right? Um, I'll be doing this in my training room. I'm not doing this right now. Um, and so you'll be getting some rules, and then hopefully you'll start um, doing this, be able to globalize those rules, and at some point you'll be able to model uh, from the bottom up. And there is a trade-off between the collective um, uh, fragility, the fragility of the collective and the fragility of the individual. And so these are just a couple of slides about how you can begin to look at um, who you recruit for different processes, um, the kind of person that is going to have the flexibility that you may need. Um, here is um, the conditions 
that you want to begin to create uh, to help those previous people, to all your people, um, do better, you know? Uh, and here's a, a small model of basically all of this in action for um, those who would, uh, who would like to know a little bit more about how to put this in practice. So first, have a prepare your mind, and that means basically know your stuff, right? Know your stuff. Um, what do they say that um, uh, uh, luck, right? Like luck is, is basically for the prepared, right? When opportunity presents itself, and that can be an unexpected event, that can be a negative consequence event, a positive consequence event. And, and this is where the skill lies, is recognizing the potential and seizing the moment. Um, and that, this has to do with seeing what is actually there, right? Then when you seize the moment, you want to try to amplify the effects and then evaluate. Just check it, you know? Uh, check your hunches. Um, you know, here, encourage small failures and evaluate. Um, and then you come back recognizing the potential that still exists or the new potential that's risen, right? And, uh, yeah, it could be simpler to the ODA loop, the UDA. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but thank you for bringing that up. Something for me to look at. Super. Um, so you have this iterative cycle, and then you can, you can bet that something else is going to happen, right? Um, and this is where layers of redundancy are, um, are important. Um, it's, redundancy is difficult. It's ambiguous because it can seem like a waste of time if nothing happens. So think about that um, hospital that they built in Baltimore. They built some huge hospital in, a, um, in an events area, and um, they never used the hospital, thank goodness. Um, that was just done, I think, in April, May for COVID. Um, great. Nothing happened. But you can also apply that to, um, to products on demand and the shortage of um, computer CPUs that people are experiencing, the fact that my Canadian friends can't get a heater um, so that they, when they have company, they can sit outside on the back porch in uh, winter, um, and other things that are, are made on demand that are just not, we're not able to get because we don't storehouse items like we used to because it was redundant and it felt like a waste of money. And regardless of the context, the thing is, is that um, something usually happens. And so in a nutshell, don't rush if you don't know. Uh, kind of practice not knowing and get comfortable with it. And if you think you know, um, don't just do something, wait. Wait and check. Wait and check, especially if you are sure in your gut that you know just the way it is. Wait. Wait. And, and an important thing for all of us is to begin to dare to look our ignorance in the face right? and be aggressively and proudly human. And this may require some structural changes in how we work, how we think, and um, how we manage uh, the unusual stuff. So, questions, noticing, this is the end of my little talk here. Sharon, thank you. And there are a whole bunch of people weighing, looking like they're going to weigh in or typing things in the, the comment box. So I'm just going to, um, while I'm waiting for any hands to go up, I'm going to go out on a limb because uh, Tanya Hewitt, First, I'm going to start with you because you were, you were staring intently as we were going on there and commenting a lot. So I think you have a, a lot of thoughts and a lot, of, a lot of observations. And you're muted. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Well, yeah, I think, I think we don't have a whole lot of comfort with uncertainty, right? We, you know, our whole, our whole structure is set on being able to predict things and knowing what that prediction will be. But, yeah. uh, but I mean, uh, if Todd Con Conklin's going to do the talk that I've already heard him do tomorrow, he'll be saying, um, we've never been good at prediction. Like, just remember this. Like, we, we, we can't predict the future. We're just, you know, like, 
We've never ever as a species been good at predicting the future. So why do we think we're any better now? So it's, um, yeah. uh, we have to, we've just been, this whole situation that this global pandemic has just highlighted how mu how um, ill prepared we are with discomfort and uncertainty. Yeah. Yet yeah. we we deal yeah. with it all the time. We just didn't notice it because our world wasn't as changing as much as it is right now. Yeah, yeah, and and it's about it's about being able to the working emergently. It's about being able to swivel. Um, and we swivel, but we swivel like a sloth often. <laughs> it takes a lot. It's kind of like the question is how bad does it need to get before you swivel, right? And how can we swivel more quickly in a way, because you're right, Tanya, it's like this whole idea of um, we want to predict. I mean, our species depends on a lot of our prediction, and that's why I say many, you know, most often, most of the time, we're, we're pretty spot on, but predicting groups of things once we get to the complexity of two people and then three people and then you're talking about companies with thousands of people our, our prediction becomes less and less better um so so robert go ahead and, and come online you put a question in the chat um uh, the difference between oh no wait uh steven uh no no that's not the one it was, hang on it was ben Seip. yeah so ben Seip, if you would, could unmute yourself that's it. Sorry, good day. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I fully formed that question. I'm still wrapping my head around it. But iatrogenics in uh, anti-fragile really struck me and it gave me pause and paused me from doing some other work because I was wondering, have I really understood this well enough? And am, am I going to make things worse? Or am, is it just a short-term tinkering? Um, and so I'm, I was having a problem squaring those two ideas. Thank you. So I, I don't I don't remember um, iatrogenic in there, um, but I, iatrogenic is basically um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the term, like in medicine, an iatrogenic disorder is a disorder that's created by the medical intervention itself. So um, it's one of the leading causes of deaths in hospital are iatrogenic disorders. Basically, what you're trying to use to heal you kills you, um, and and I think that um, in relationship to to um, uh, our, our work is often what we're doing to help ourselves is, is making things worse. And, and so the tinkering, the small tinkering, so, so rather than giving somebody like this massive dose of antibiotics, um, let's see what's the smallest thing we can do. Like I think in Australia, they use the Manuka honey. They're actually, um, so it's a very, it, it seems like a small thing, but it actually has a, a greater um, possibility of, of help. Um, so I, I think you can do both, and I think that's part of this whole idea of thinking systemically of, of being more comfortable with complexity is, is being able to work with this rather than going yes, no, yes, no, left, right, this or that. It's, it's how do you work with both and uh, perhaps a third thing. I, I don't know. Was that helpful at all, Ben? No, I, I believe it was, and that's something where I was kind of landing on myself. Uh, both, are, both are needed. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for jumping yeah. in there, Ben. And um, uh, Bill Caffiero, if you could unmute yourself, and you, you had shared a bit of an insight earlier in the chat with your experience. Can you add a little bit more to that? Uh, just the, you know, my experience with the clean questions, and I was skeptical of it at first, and I did a two-hour session with Sharon, and then at the following year I did an eight-hour session. Um, and it is – some people think it's kind of touchy-feely, but I brought it back to our engineers, um, and it was very popular. Uh, so much so, uh, during our work from home, when we started in March, I made the suggestion, could I put it online? Well, they went, all of our safety investigators went through it. Uh, all of our uh, investigations for manufacturing incidents went through it. And we went worldwide. Uh, all of, I work for Merck, uh, about 15 different sites. As a matter of fact, in two weeks, I'm doing a session that's primarily geared toward our site in Ireland. Uh, I have about 20 people signed up. Literally hundreds of people have taken this and, and given me uh, rave reviews. And it's not, the value is 
it's in your interpersonal relationship. It's not just on the job. It's not just investigating. Um, it, 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 just by going through the sequence of events, like for instance, I had an incident where somebody forgot to sign for something and I went and I was like, well, what did you do? What happened next? What happened next? And, and he skipped over the step to sign it. And, and, and it was because, and we were just going through the general, we weren't going through the specifics of that day. And he said, do you realize I just skipped the step that I missed? And, and, and I said, I do. And, you know, we just sort of uh, followed from there. And, and we, we came to a revelation as to why he did that. And we could see that in his thinking, it was to skip that step. But if I had started out and said, why did you skip that step? Or why did you miss that step? I don't think I would have gotten that. And then also, you know, you have these, we have these like $2 million discards. And I have to interview three people that I never met before. And... Um, it can get testy and the ultimate conflict resolution. I always tell people, this is the opposite of telling someone to calm down. When you tell someone to calm down, it never has the intended effect. But when you say to someone, what would you like to have happen next? It totally deescalates. Often they'll say, well, gee, you know, I don't know. You know, and uh, it's, 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 it's a great transformation. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's improved relationships in my life. It's improved my work. And it's got me, you know, global recognition at my company. Thank, thank you, Bill. And, and your example was um, a really good example of the, the person who didn't sign, we skipped that step, is a really good example of himself modeling. He discovered the step he skipped. Um, it, it, as he was going through the process. That was really, really nice. Um, thank you. And, um, and Robert, um, Robert, you have, what's the difference between trial and error and trial and feedback? Um, the difference between trial and error and trial and feedback is when you're doing trial and feedback, you expect error. You know error is going to happen. You have your attention out for where the error happens and you're catching it at the smallest uh, moment like like your job is to start to catch the smallest error so that you can swivel so that you can make a better uh, decision so that you can change your process quickly um, rather than uh, trial and error which the error is often noticed in retrospect so that's that's a little bit of it um, and Sharon, else? we do have a question. I think Robert Massengill. Robert, you've unmuted yourself. Do you want to? Oh, yeah. No, she was answering my question. Thank you. Okay. That's what I thought, but just wanted to make sure we're, we're on the same sink here. Yeah. So, um, so I have an example of, um, of an anti-fragile um, person in Japan. His name is Yuji Yamagami. Uh, Bob knows him. Uh, Charles knows him. And he came... Um, he came to Toronto and he did a session. And what he didn't know at the time, and it was a really rough session, it, it was very hard on him. What he didn't know at the time is that he had Alzheimer's. And um, so all he knew is that something wasn't working quite right in his brain, his memory wasn't the way it used to be. Um, and, and I thought when he came and did this, this presentation in Toronto that it was because he'd traveled internationally, he does, you know, English isn't his first language. Um, and he was trying to take a really complex subject and, um, and, and make it into a, a, a tiny little 40 minute segment. Um, so what happened between uh, the time he came to Toronto and the time when he was actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's is he's taught, I don't know, something like 9,000 internal auditors in Japan um, method uh, working with clean language questions. So he created a model to work with these internal auditors and he, he taught them. And he used to teach them from his short-term memory 
And what he had to do is it's like this part of his little brain wasn't working anymore. He still had his history, but he couldn't remember what was happening in the room. So somebody could say something and 10 minutes later, he wouldn't know what it was. So he began to simplify and simplify and simplify. And he has created a process for teaching internal auditors how to work with clean language, where the, the students and the participants are basically teaching each other. And he can still use his history knowledge without having to remember what just happened. And, and that, I, I think that is a great example of somebody not just being robust and resilient and trying to slog through what he already created, but becoming incredibly anti-fragile and creating a, a process of training, something that is complex in a way that works. Um, it, it's, and he still, he is still getting hired um, by people. People still want him to come. And, and they know, they know he, where he is. Um, with his health, um, an amazing person. Um, yeah. So, um, anybody else? Any other questions? Or I guess we've got. No, oh, we're on the top of the hour. No. Any? If there's anybody else that has a burning desire to pop in, uh, I'm willing to take another like uh, 92 seconds to. <laughs> well, let's see if anybody pops in in that 92 seconds, Sharon. And uh, while we're waiting then I'll just keep an eye on the chat box and also people unmuting themselves or raising their hands. Sharon, um, thank you. That was, I, I loved it and I really appreciate that. And um, it looks like we have no more questions now, but likely we will later after we do some breakout groups. So we're gonna go into a, a, a 29 minute break um, and we'll see you back here at 3.30 U.S. Eastern Time, and we'll go into some breakout groups and do a little more in-depth discussion. Sharon, thank you very much. Everybody, thank you for a great conversation. Okay, welcome back, everybody. After that nice uh, half-hour break, we are back and ready to start on some breakout groups. Uh, some of you, most of you, went through um, a similar cadence yesterday and or this morning. For some of you, this might be new. So. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a, an overview of what we're going to do for the next hour. First off, um, you should have an email that described this already, and you may have already participated in it. But for the first breakout group, we're going to, to facilitate the debrief and capturing your key themes and insights by using pollev.com. Uh, best way to use it, if you haven't already, is go to a browser on your mobile device um, and go to pollev.com and use the username 2019 HPRCT. Uh, so after the first um, breakout group, we'll be using that. The flow of the breakout groups will be like this. So what we'll do for the first breakout group is similar to what we did yesterday and this morning is we'll put you into groups of probably seven or eight people. They'll be different than um, what you were in this morning if you were in breakout groups this morning because that'll help us with some diversity the thought and expose you to different people um, and ask you to talk about your key insights and takeaways from Sharon's presentation. So you'll just be sharing your aha moments and the things that really stood out to you um, or things you might need more clarity on. Uh, so it could be that. We'll come back together. We'll do just a little bit of discussion about our observations, the themes that we see coming out of that, um, out of those breakout groups. And then we'll go into breakout group two. And this time I've changed the the instruction, what I'd like you to focus on just a little bit. So what in that breakout group, I'll be asking you to focus on what is the smallest thing you can do to make a difference with what you heard this afternoon in your respective organizations. And then we'll come back together for another debrief on that and look for some, some common themes or some insights that, you know, we, we might not have thought of um, ourselves that we're seeing from the breakout groups and do some discussion there. So, I'm going to put you into random breakout groups. I may, um, I may shuffle you a little bit based on the population, but that'll get settled down really, really quickly. And if you, if you need help when you're in the breakout group, please use the ask for help button. I'll come in and we can talk through anything you need to. And I will also be sending you instructions as you get into the breakout group and throughout. So with that, I am going to get the breakout group set up and put you into them and I'm going to pause there for a moment because 
need to set them up. Okay, so there we go. I'm gonna open all the rooms and we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Okay, it looks like we are getting everybody back into this large group. So as you can see on the screen, if you would please go to polyd.com and username 2019HPRCT and just give us the, uh, the one word or the short phrase from each of you that best describes your, your key takeaways or insights from the discussion that we had today in Sharon's presentation. So go and, and do that if you haven't already and looks like we're still getting people back into this room. So we'll give that a little bit of time for people to come back to the large group um, and share their key takeaways and insights on 2019 on polyv.com. And Bob Nelms, if you could, when, when you start getting some, some responses, if you could share that out and, and Sharon, let's take a look at it and see what kind of themes pop out with people's key insights, their takeaways from your presentation and the discussion we had earlier this afternoon. So Bob is sharing those out. Thank you, Bob. So Sharon, well, I'll turn first to you and ask for any observations or thoughts that you have as you're seeing the word cloud start to appear um, with the, the insights and takeaways people had. Well, I, I think if when we're looking at it, we have complexity, context, and, and depth, right? So, um, uh, in my group, somebody was saying, you know, Shane, Shane Bush says context is king. And, and I like to say context is queen because context is for the people from the people, right? So um, kings are top-down rulers. Queens do something different. Um, <laughs> Very nice. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'm, I think that the main points that I was hoping people would um, that I was working with and, and hoping people would get is that, that trial and feedback, um, that there's often greater complexity than, than we anticipate um, or we think. You know, it's, it, we're, we are, as well as meaning makers, we're also simplifiers in some ways and complexifiers. You know, it's like the whole thing about how much information our brain can hold. It's, um, I like to say it's where we can put our attention and how much we attention, how much attention we have to put there. And the more complex things are, um, once we get to that place where we're relating complexity with chaos, um, we will shrink things down to a size that fits into um, what might be called like our, uh, our, our bandwidth, you know, our body, mind bandwidth. Um, and, and it's not to do with uh, intellect at all. It, it, has, it has to do with everything that's going on uh, around us, at home, in our um, social system, at work plus the context that we're in that may be getting more complex than we first anticipated. Um, learning, you know, learning um, through a curiosity. Um, yeah, and the depth, I'm really curious about that. Um, yeah, so actually. I'm curious about that as well. Like, so anybody that typed in the word depth, if you could unmute yourself and, and share a little more insight, that'd be great. I know somebody has to have put it in there at least once. See if we have anybody that can join into this conversation. But it is interesting yeah. how. Um, oh. Just, just pop, pop it in the chat if you like. Um, yeah. Go ahead and just pop it into the chat if you don't want to pop on camera or 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 um, uh, unmute. Um, I mean, I know I know how I interpret depth, but I'm really curious um, since that came up. I mean, it's not small. Uh, uh, com context and learning are the biggest ones, yay, um, but depth and complexity have about the same size. Um, they do. While we're waiting, Sharon, I got a, I got a, a question. It's a burning question. The, the story you told about Yuji was, was inspirational to, sell, to say the least. 
not everybody that goes through that kind of awful experience for him uh, turns out the way he did. I, yeah. Any insight at all into how or why or what factors there were involved in, in him turning out the way he did? Um, I mean, I can tell you what he said is that um, basically his immersion in clean and his use of clean and the ability to self-model has helped him um, uh, one, ask questions about what others are experiencing and, um, and also really notice um, in very small ways um, what is changing about him. Um, so he, I mean, it's not the only thing. I mean, the, the man is really amazing and has been through um, some incredible trials um, over his adulthood. And, um, and he's just a persistent, really persistent guy. I mean, he's, he's smart, he's a natural modeler, and he's persistent. And, and, um, and he has a tool that helps him figure out what might need to happen next. Thanks, and a driving Sharon. wife. I will say that. A very driving wife. Emmy is amazing. She's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for that question, Bob. And let's see, anybody else want to just share an insight? Uh, if you want to unmute yourself or chat into the chat box, any big takeaways um, that you want to share from that brief discussion you had in the breakout group? See if anybody wants to raise a hand or jump in. Oh, Steve Prevett. Steve, what are your thoughts? Sure, I always love to jump in. Yeah, I, I always love systems as a kid. Maybe that's why I have a model railroad. Is the the whole idea of systems and interrelations was always fascinating to me. And of course, as I say, I went from being an engineer, deterministic, to probabilistic. But yes, this leap to, and I kind of followed into the N N N lead because of Tom Peters. He quoted and said, "You got to go read Fooled by Randomness. You got to go read uh, Black Swan." So from Tom Peters, and he's the guy with the OODA loop. He who observes, orients, decides, and acts the fastest and goes back through the loop to correct themselves wins. You know, fail forward fast, uh, all that. But uh, one thing talking with the group kind of reminded me of like the story of post-it notes or the, you know, the story of super glue. Those were black swan events. Nobody was looking for super glue. In fact, somebody discovered it in World War II because they were working on what would make a good windshield and they're like, well, what's this? And discarded it. And then somebody was trying to make uh, liquid to put on a glass slide under a microscope and realize what they had. But, you know, twice there was a black swan event of somebody discovering super glued alpha cyrocyclinate or whatever it is. And I see Sharon smiling. So I'll shut up now and let her carry it on. <laughs> That's right. I was just, um, yeah. I mean, those are great examples. Uh, or like um, Tanya mentions Viagra, right? Um, uh, you know, for, for vascular health and <clears throat> voila, you know, who knew? Apparently breathing and um, anyway, I'll leave Viagra for another time. But, um, but yeah, it, it's those, those kinds of things, you know, it's like, um, it may not even look like a, a huge consequential, a consequential event, but can you imagine your life without sticky notes? I mean, my mother was sticky note dependent. I, I mean, when I was raising my daughter, I'd, I'd get to the store with sticky notes because I knew that if I put my note down someplace else, I'd forget it. Um, so it was like my second brain for a little while. So, yeah. Great examples, Stephen. Yeah, great examples and great takeaways that everybody had from uh, in their breakout group discussion. So now we are going to go back into the groups, and this time we'll spend a bit longer. So we'll spend uh, 15 minutes or so, um, and I will give you instructions on what I want you to focus on. But again, it's that what is the smallest thing we can do to really make a difference? Um, so I'll put you back into the groups. And as earlier, if you need help, just just uh, hit the ask for help button and I'll be there and I'll send you some instructions when you're in the rooms. So enjoy the breakout group discussion. Okay, it looks like we have most everybody back. So, uh, so we'll do the same thing we did earlier. What I'd like to do is 
go ahead and chat into the chat box. What is the, the one small thing you're going to do? What's the smallest thing you're going to do to make a difference um, with what you heard earlier, earlier today in your respective organizations? So um, we'll start looking for those in the chat box. Um, start looking for some themes and some observations. And let's get some people who want to volunteer to, to give us some comments on your breakout group discussions. Here, they're starting to come in. This is great. Intentional, intentionality. Be more curious. Learn by trial and feedback. Ask better questions. So Sharon, as you're looking at these things coming in, um, love to hear from you about what your insights are about what people uh, are taking away and what they're going to do with it, more importantly. I think people are, are getting some of the foundational concepts of clean language. So, so you don't have to like come to a webinar or a class, just keep going. No, actually you can come to a webinar and a class. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, asking what would you like to have happen? Um, you know, listen more, talk less, proactive versus reactive, abundant listening, micro experimentation. I, I mean, I'm feeling I'm feeling more robust and um, and uh, and successful. So um, thank you. I, I mean, I, I thought a lot about what, what is the main point. What what is it that I'd like you guys to to come away with? And um, and I'm as I said, I'm not a consultant. I I don't have answers. Um, but but I I, I do um, hope to help people devise their own answers and and self model in the thinking. Um, so yeah, so okay, David, great. Yeah, there's some, some really great thoughts in there. So who yeah, wants to, let's, let's see if we can get anybody to volunteer for uh, sharing any insights that, that they have. Just go ahead and unmute yourself or raise a hand. Just pop on in, come on. So here's one. Go can ahead, Jay. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Hey there. So I was talking with uh, David Boyce in the in this small group, and uh, Sharon, I haven't taken any of your classes, but I've I used to do for about four years when I was in grad school uh, uh, experiential learning, experiential outdoor education, taking people out on ropes courses and orienteering, and then doing some pretty heavy debriefs, which sometimes I'm not a therapist, but would border on really very insightful. And what we learned was not quite to make our speech metaphor free, but to use metaphor intentionally. Meaning, is this conversation a game? If you're not careful, you may frame a conversation as a chess game. Trouble is in a chess game, there's a winner and a loser and there's no luck. But if you frame a conversation as a dance, that's an entirely different kind of interaction. And it just become more aware of the metaphors that you do use. I've learned to do that. You take a different tack, which is basically get the metaphors out of your language so that you can listen to the other person's metaphors. At least that's what I understand of your ideas. Yeah. So it, it connects. Yeah. Anyway, I was just making a connection. It, it does connect, Jake. And, and actually being aware of the metaphors that you're using help you pivot more quickly when you notice that somebody in the group perhaps isn't aligned with a dance metaphor, for example. Maybe to them, the conversation is a game. And if you notice that and you, you understand that you're, you're imposing a metaphor on the group, if you're doing it verbally and making it, and they can agree or not agree. It's, it's like in business when you go on like, you know, your, your uh, whatever it is, your thing where everybody goes and they're all going to climb a mountain, metaphorical mountain together. And, and people can agree or not agree. But um, uh, if you're aware of the own your own metaphors for things, then when there's a, a difference or a non-compliance, it doesn't look aggressive and it doesn't have the same heat that um, you just notice, oh, like what's happening for you? So uh, right now a conversation is a dance, but uh, I'm noticing um, that you're, you might, you're doing something a little different. What is this conversation for you? And, and that's where it becomes really valuable um, can I ask a follow-up question at the, at the risk of asking too much? How do I phrase this succinctly? Um, if you're 
if you notice somebody else using a very uh, binary metaphor, win, lose, yes, no, right, wrong, that's it, and you're trying to get them to see things a little bit more flexibly, but they're insisting that's not a metaphor. That's just the way reality is. They don't see that they're they don't see that they're speaking through a lens or a filter. They just go, that's the way reality is. How can you respond to that? How can you help them out of that very black white way of thinking? Or or can you? Well, the the first is context, 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 yeah. and the second of all is to um, do you stop stop helping? Just stop helping ask questions, find out what is this binary for them, and when it's binary, and this is the third thing you want, what needs to happen for them to get to that third thing? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, you can provide constraints. You have to have constraints. Yeah. I mean, our bodies are constrained. I, it's a whole, that's a whole, like, lovely conversation. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jake. Thanks for jumping in, and thank you, Sharon. So other, other takeaways, are there the other things that anyone wants to share about the, the small steps you're going to take, the things you can do to make a difference? There are discussion from the breakout groups. So I'd like to hear one more, maybe a few more. See if we have any more volunteers. And while we're waiting for that, so Robert was... Yeah. So, so I was going to mention, Lauren um, put in the chat, language can help us navigate the uncertainty yeah. more effectively. And, um, and Lauren is, uh, we've had, we've had uh, long conversations about what she and I both do. And, um, and clean language, I, I just want to like point out really quickly that clean language isn't a psychological model. Um, you can come into clean with any psychological background you want, business background, belief system. Um, clean is a neutral linguistic model. Um, it, it's it it really is very literally based on the words that we use and um, and um, deeply entrenched in cognitive science um, versus psychology. Uh, Thank so you. Language can help us. Thank you, Lauren, for that. And it looks like you know we've got oh Dan. Dan, you are unmuted. What are what are you what are your thoughts? Hey, Dean, thank you, Sharon. Great job. I, I really, I, I the way I love the way that you presented. I love the 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 pictures and imagery used to help us realize there's so many things that we don't control. But in a way, we're we're doing our best to to manage those things. And and so I think it really inspired our minds. Like, how do we? What can we do as an organization to to handle those events? And so I kind of. <laughs> so I got a hard question for you. I went straight to the super controversial, super what's on everybody's mind. Um, Good. So let me give you the scenario. And I'm sorry, Dean, if I'm out of line, you can kick and, and me out. And you know, out. Dan, I probably don't have the answer. So keep going. Come on. Okay. I, I don't think you do. So this, but I, I want to hear your, your mindset thinking through it. But anyways, President of the United States calls you because he knows that you just presented at this HPRCT conference on being anti-fragile and he asked your opinion on how to respond to the covid crisis knowing that it's something we've never seen before we're in these unknown times how do we as a country organization how do we respond what's the right way to do that so leaving the president out of it um because uh i i don't i don't deal with uh maybes and um like pretend situations, even in the training room. Um, but COVID is a real event, and, and it is happening. And, um, and I mean, I have my personal opinion. I, I'm happy to share it, but I don't know if it belongs here um, about what we can do. Um, I like to say there's a lot of people who are following their own science. Um, so as a country, um, just like I was talking in my small group, when it comes to psychology, it's like pick one. Pick anybody, pick anybody's psychology. If you want to be a Freudian, be a Freudian, be a Jungian, you know, follow Gottman and his relationship theory, follow Schnarch, but pick one. And, um, and it's the same with, with COVID, you know, it's like pick our poison and, um, and stick with it long enough to see if something is actually going to take effect. Um, 
but I, 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 I mean, I know what my science is, um, but uh, I, I, so that's all I got for you, Dan. No, that, that's, that's good. I mean, that makes sense. I think, I think within our organizations, because I can apply it to what we do as well. Um, I have a strong background in emergency management, and we do yeah. a lot of, of table topping and trying to foresee what could actually occur. One of the best ways to, to mitigate those unwanted outcomes is by doing assessments and actively engage in those assessments. You learn things that you'd never thought of just walking through those steps. And it's hard when you don't know what to even, what to even table top against, what, what tomorrow might look like. And that's where it gets hard, but I think you've got a good point. If you choose something, give it time to see if it works and then adjust, um, take that feedback and overcome. So, no, very good. Hey, thank you so much, Sharon. Yeah, and, and, and you know, as an aside, we were talking about the redundancy. You know, it's, it's better to, it's like this hospital in Baltimore. I mean, it's gotten so much heat for the millions of dollars that the city spends to have, you know, 175 patients or something go through it. Um, but, you know, how grateful we should be that that system was in place because um, New York City didn't have all that in place. And, um, and they were hit much harder in different ways that, than were expected. Um, you know, I mean, I never thought about a U-Haul truck being used as a portable morgue before, frankly. Um, so redundancy in systems, is it redundant to wear a mask? You know what, it doesn't matter. If you look at, con, you know, this, I use the word um, complex convexity. Um, you take a bad mask and a bad mask and you reduce that are only 50% effective and pretty soon you've got a 75% effectiveness. Um, so yeah, just keep going. And, um, and it's, this is the kind of situation we really won't be able to look at in hindsight until later. And it is not a black swan. Hey, thanks, Dan, for jumping in there. And thanks, Sharon. And you know what? I think we have time for one more quick one. I'm going to go out on one little tiny limb. Adam Cunningham, you had your hand up before. Do you want to jump in and ask one more question or offer an insight? Sure. Yeah, I thought we were out of time. but um, No, sir. First, first, thanks for the presentation. It was great and compelling to, to want to dig deeper. But I will say, and I heard some of this in our group, too, that it's um, – it's a big bite and a lot of it we don't understand, you know, um, so it makes me want to read some of the books you're talking about and to dig into what you're in what some of the stuff you've presented. You know, we feel like we've made big steps in old organizations to go from where we were to even talking about resiliency and robustness to now think that there's something beyond that. Um, that's not a bad thing. It's something to look into and but I, I don't have an understanding for it. And I'm not really sure how I would, because I don't have that understanding, I don't know how I would come to a management or leadership team and present um, an affinity for fragility because it leads to anti-fragility and trying to explain that. Um, but it makes me want to know more. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. And, um, and I can tell you um, the, the reader on Audible who reads uh, Nassim Taleb's book is great. He, he like throws out just enough of Taleb's kind of like sassy, in your facey kind of nature. Um, and, and all we need to do is just grasp one point. And, and really it's about grassroots effort, isn't it? It's about each of us, um, the small us and the bigger us, um, making one, one small change that makes a difference for ourselves and, and others that, that we care about and work with. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for jumping in there. And, and Sharon, thanks for that. And I will just turn to you. We're on the, the home stretch here. So any final words for folks as we wrap up this day? Um, drink wine. Uh, lot, lots of wine. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what time it is where you are, but heck, it's 1.30 here almost. It's time for a glass of wine. And um, yeah, and, and this is a big bite. And, and it is... Um, it's outside our purview of thinking, and it's not prescriptive. Um, just let it settle. Wait. Just wait. Let it settle. I love that closing thought. Thank you. Um, so quick logistics to wrap up the day. First off, Sharon, thank you so much for, for everything. Um, everybody, thank you for the energetic conversation that we had and spending time in the breakout groups and sharing insights and thoughts with each other. I really appreciate it. Um, many of you will see back here tomorrow at the same start time, 10 a.m. 
Um, U.S. Eastern will have some videos going at 9 9.30 a.m. U.S. Eastern time. And as we did yesterday, we'd love to hear any feedback that you have from today. So do a quick, uh, before you leave, if you'd like, I would welcome the feedback, any plus, minus, um, things that you appreciated that worked well, or constructive feedback you have from how the virtual conference went. Uh, would love to have it. So thank you very much, and uh, have, have a great glass of wine and a great afternoon, evening.